Thank you. We're having, we, we have a good turnout. So we appreciate you taking the time to listen to us today. Um, so as San Francisco, the nation and the world emerged from this pandemic, the city by the Bay is known as a beacon of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, our sponsor Wells Fargo today is proud to be launching this celebration, showcasing these shining examples of diversity. So in today's program, we'll be featuring six local leaders, one from each of the cultural districts who will paint a high level picture of their special neighborhood district and the role their organization is playing in preserving and promoting the district. So let's get started. My name is uh, Vasque Neres. I am a small business advocate here in San Francisco. Um, I was born in Greece and my father had grocery stores in the Mission, the Excelsior. And that's where I really uh, understood the value of small business and uh, what they do for the community. As we all know, they're more than just places of commerce and culture is such a big part of that as well. And um, now I have this agency, uh, I'm one of the co-founders, it's called NexSF, and we create private public partnerships uh, to promote small business, neighborhood corridors, and culture uh, that's right here in San Francisco. So today I'd like you to welcome you to our cultural district's uh, community forum, which has been sponsored by Wells Fargo. In this program, we are presenting a curated collection of districts. These districts include uh, Calle 24 in the Mission, Japantown, uh, the Castro LGBTQ District, Soma Filipinas, and the Leather and LGBTQ District as well in South of Market. By the way, a cultural district is a geographic area within San Francisco that embodies a unique heritage and receives um, financial support from San Francisco. Each of these districts is defined by its residents uh, and cultural and historical contributions to the city. Uh, for example, these districts may have locally owned businesses, uh, music venues, and colorful and festivals, uh, which define a district. So before we start our program, we have a few housekeeping rules. If, um, if this webinar is being recorded, so if you miss something, if you wanna hear it again, or if you wanna share it with your friends, community, uh, wait for the follow-up email from us, or you can go to our YouTube channel, watch this program and all the other pro programs that we've been doing for the past two years. Um, there's a nice selection and it's a nice way to familiarize, re-familiarize yourself with the city, the people that keep it thriving and also the cultural institutions that keep it thriving as well. Um, so I think you're all Zoom experts at this point, but uh, it's been over two and a half years. So if you have any questions, uh, please drop them in the Q&A section up above. Um, after everyone presents, uh, we will have the opportunity to ask a question either to specific panelists or we can ask them to all the panelists as well. Uh, so let's get started with our program. Um, I'm very proud to present uh, Scott Wilson. He is the small business segment consultant at Wells Fargo. Uh, welcome to the stage, Scott. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Voss, and I'm very excited to be here today. Um, as Voss mentioned, my name's Scott Wilson, um, and uh, with Wells Fargo, I am the small business segment consultant. And so what that means is I support all of our small business bankers um, in the branch to best help our small businesses really be able to help them meet their needs, as well as, of course, um, help them really succeed and uh, meet their goals. And so, you know, we know that this past two years, really the pandemic hit our small business one of the hardest. And so with that, Wells Fargo in July of 2020 actually announced that we would be donating $420 million as part of our PPP processing fees that were received by the bank as um, a result of participating in the uh, PPP program. And so with that, we actually launched the Open for Business Fund. And so the Open for Business Fund is a recovery effort aimed to help small businesses open, recover and rebuild, particularly for racially and ethnically diverse owned uh, businesses. And so in our most recent phase of funding for the Open for Business Fund, Wells Fargo actually awarded 17 OFB Bay Area grants, totaling $14.5 million. And I am very excited and proud to announce that seven of those were uh, here in San Francisco alone. And so very excited to be um, a part of this webinar today and really about Small Business Appreciation Week. And so with that, we do have a short video to share more about the Open for Business Fund and how it's helped our small businesses. Good 
Good afternoon, le printemps. Before COVID hit, the shop was doing fantastically. And then Suha, we have to cancel. Suha, we have to cancel. I started thinking, oh my gosh, how am I gonna survive? We knew exactly when the PPP loans were going to open. And honestly, we didn't even really think of anything other than Wells Fargo. This is who we bank with. It brought the business back. We opened this space up and we got two days of business in pre-COVID shutdown. We were going to maybe close Monday and Tuesday and reevaluate Wednesday. Wednesday still hasn't really come. PPP was a huge lifeline. We took all of the proceeds from our PPP loans, 420 million of it, and we established the Open for Business Fund to really help small businesses and minority-owned businesses with all of the issues that they were dealing with with the pandemic. We were making sales like crazy. All of a sudden, COVID hit. It's like, what just happened? With the money, I was able to buy software that I can use to comfortably work from home as a single parent in this time of COVID. We worked with an amazing team at Wells Fargo who was able to walk us through every step of the way to acquire that SBA loan. We are a minority-owned business and Wells Fargo opened the doors for us. Say thank you for having us. Um, very excited to be here and of course help our small businesses. And so any way that we can, feel free to reach out to your local small business um, banker. Thank you, thank you. And um, you know, these are stressful times for small business, I might add, and just for the audience. And uh, this is uh, National Small Business Month. San Francisco has Small Business Week, which the chamber is organizing. And you know, we always say small business is big business. There are actually uh, 90,000 businesses in the city half of them are considered uh, small. That means they employ 10 or less employees, but they employ almost 400,000 people in the city. So it's a huge part of our culture, our economy. And um, at the end of the day, um, actually City Hall states this, if we change our buying by 10% to local shopping, it creates $100 million back to the local economy. So, you know, we know Amazon is convenient, but please uh, make your buying you know, uh, think about what you buy and who you support. So um, thank you, Scott, we appreciate that. Um, and before we start our program with the panelists, we actually have a very fun video showcasing the cultural district. So Dominic, take it away. Excellent video. Nice way to start the program. So uh, we have so much to be proud of in San Francisco and the cultural districts help us um, with that because we have culture is something that that's not replicable anywhere else in the world. So we need to be highlighting this. So first up, we're going to um, 
one of my favorite districts in the city, Japantown, right in the heart of uh, District 5, in the middle of the city. Uh, welcome aboard Susie Kagami. She is the, the manager and longtime uh, community leader of the Japantown uh, Cultural District. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. You do such a great job with Nexus, Next SF, connecting us all online and uh, making sure that we stay connected and know what's happening with, uh, throughout the city. Um, Scott, thank you so much for Wells Fargo for this opportunity um, to share the vibrancy of San Francisco cultural districts. Um, we have so much pride in servicing our communities and the people of San Francisco, and along with the many of the other panelists on this um, forum, like I am proud to stand here with them and work with them um, doing the good work we do. Um, just, yeah, Voss asked me to talk a little bit about San Francisco, Japantown. So we are 116 years old in the location that we are at, um, the oldest and largest of three Japantowns left in the nation. Um, in the late 1800s, the Issei, our first generation, immigrated here from Japan and lived in Chinatown and south of Market, uh, where the shipyards were. And after the earthquake and fires of 1906, uh, our community moved west and established Japantown in the Western Edition, where it is now. So our vibrant Japantown used to be 40 blocks wide and deep, crossing Geary. Um, and it was a vibrant community of businesses, small businesses, um, a lot of mom and pop businesses, uh, cultural community organizations. Um, it was really a, a time where um, our community came together to be in, in unity with each other and to really help each other out. Um, and uh, we were displaced twice, however, once with uh, the unjust incarceration of World War II when many of our families were sent off to um, incarceration camps and then Secondly, um, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, redevelopment happened. Many of you might know that, um, where it, we were actually displaced, bulldozed um, to create what is now uh, the Japan Center Malls, the Peace Plaza, and the Geary Street Transit Corridor. Um, so it, it took some time to rebuild twice again. Um, today, we are resilient still yet. Um, especially after the pandemic, we had so much, uh, so many of our small businesses close um, and suffer during the, those hard times. Um, and thankfully, it's slowly coming back. But unfortunately, we lost a, a lot of really key businesses in our community. Um, but, you know, we look to the bright side. And today, our Japanese and Japanese American community, um, we all commute into the district, uh, but we all celebrate our cultural assets, such as um, our festivals, as many of you know, Cherry Blossom, Mihama Street Fair, uh, our small businesses, a place, you know, our eateries, which I'm sure most of you enjoy, um, and shopping um, to attract the young folks back to our community. Um, right now, the, our Japanese American, again, our Japanese Americans can come in to Japantown to um, to really raise our children there. And that's how I was drawn back. Um, my child went to Nihomachi Little Friends, our cultural preschool, went on to JBBP, our Japanese bilingual program, um, one of two in San Francisco public schools um, that provide Japanese curriculum daily to our kids, um, language programs, taiko classes, Japanese cultural community center, um, and, and our seniors, um, there's, we have a great uh, senior program uh, as well. Japantown is one of the highest density of seniors in San Francisco. Um, so yeah, what is Japantown Cultural District? Today, we are a beautiful intergenerational mix of four to five generations, Japanese American, um, mixed race, newcomers from Japan town, newcomers from Japan, um, we're home to over 10 legacy businesses within five blocks. We're home to a Julia Morgan National Landmark Historical Building, which houses one of our only authentic no theaters on the West Coast. And we have over 60 cultural arts and groups, uh, well, pre-pandemic. So uh, we're, we are really um, helping to perpetuate those and keep those sustaining in, in Japantown. Um, so yeah, we just, you know, we're happy to, you know, create this place for our Japantown, um, for Japantown Cultural District. Um, we were founded two years ago. 
uh, we really, as a cultural district, as funded by the city, um, we are really charged to safeguard the 20 blocks we have left. We preserve the district for our next generations. Um, we support economic recovery for our small businesses and merchants. Uh, we look at housing and economic barriers, advocate for hopefully our gen next generation of Japanese Americans to be able to afford and return back to Japantown. And our hope is that our community leaders are able to revive and sustain a vibrant, authentic community cultural um, place for our future generations. Um, we are thankful actually to be working with our Soma Filipinas partners. Um, through arts and culture, we hope to bring back our next generations to have pride in our community. Um, and we are working on an arts, arts and culture hub called COHO, um, COHOSF.com. And um, it's really a return, a hope and a beacon to return our next generation of Japan town, uh, J Japanese American communities back to Japan town. So I would encourage you all to join our mailing list. Uh, we have a brand new website japantownculturaldistrict.org. Um, we'd love for you to come visit us, join us, um, click on the icon of how to get involved and uh, plug in to how to support our small businesses, come volunteer um, and just uh, in, come and enjoy Japantown um, as we all love it and as we call it home. So thank you. Bravo, Susie. That was perfect. I was going to ask, how can people be involved? But you just shared that. So it's perfect. <laughs> Thank you again. Um, so now we're going to go south uh, to South of Market. Um, uh, we want to welcome uh, Bob Brown. He's president of the board at the Leather LGBTQ Cultural District. So welcome, Bob. Thank you, Voss. Uh, I'm also excited to be here. Uh, and uh, I see a lot of uh, my cohorts that I've seen in various meetings at various times uh, during my stint with, the, with my cultural district. So I'm happy uh, to be on this program with them. Um, I moved to San Francisco in 1978. And at that time, um, there were over 50 businesses uh, in, in the South of Market area uh, that supported leather and LG. T, B, oh, I can't even say it now, LGBTQ uh, uh, individuals. Um, and, and it was a vibrant neighborhood uh, that contributed greatly to the culture of the, of the city and, and to its economic growth. Uh, Soma is, is not only known in, in San Francisco, in California, but it's also well worldwide known. And we get visitors from, from other countries quite often to uh, celebrate our, our various festivals that we have uh, during the year. <clears throat> but these days, they, we're down to uh, less than uh, 15 businesses in the South of Market area. Um, and uh, it, it, as other districts have been going through, uh, it's a struggle to, to uh, keep businesses up and running, um, to keep housing affordable for people to live in the area um, and to keep our streets safe so that uh, um, it, it, it's become important for our cultural district to, to work with other cultural districts to make sure that everyone has a rich uh, cultural filled uh, environment to live in. And, and that's what we're working toward. Um, the, uh, the Leather and LGBT Cultural District is the world's first Leather and LGBT Cultural District. Um, and it was created by a resolution um, <clears throat> that was unanimously passed by the uh, San Francisco Board of Supervisors on May 1st, 2018. And it was signed by the, by the mayor um, on May 9th. So we're a relatively young organization, um, but we plan to uh, make ourselves known. Um, uh, some of our plans in the coming, in the coming months are, um, well, our most recent, uh, recent event will be this coming Saturday, uh, May 7th, when we will be celebrating our anniversary. This is our first major get together post pandemic. We had planned to have a first anniversary party 
um, in 2019, but uh, COVID kept knocking on our door and everybody was shut in, so we couldn't have that celebration. But um, this coming Saturday, the celebration starts at 5 and goes until 9 p.m. It will be at the uh, Folsom Foundry at, on 425 Folsom Street. So it's a free event. You're all welcome to come and help us celebrate. Um, <clears throat> some of our other events are, we've been sponsoring Soma Second Saturdays, which is an, an attempt to uh, revitalize the businesses in the area. So once a month, artists and businesses hold a street fair in the South of Market area, uh, and people come and enjoy and celebrate. This is a great way to get people out after, after our COVID experience. Um, it's a great way to build community. Uh, we've had some of our sister uh, uh, cultural districts come and join us. Um, so that's every second Saturday of every month. Uh, <clears throat> we were also planning, uh, Ringo Alley is, is, is a, a big part of our history and it has been revitalized with uh, new markers and, and renovated. And we're going to have a Ringo Alley celebration on June 18th, uh, the times will be uh, determined at a later date, but, uh, but you might wanna put that on your calendar. And there's always Door Alley and Folsom Street Fair, which are the last Sundays of, well, Door Alley is the last Sunday in July, Folsom Street is the last Sunday in September. And the week before that, uh, September 18th in September, there will be Leather Walk again. We had it last year. We'll have it again this year. Some of our future plans are, one, what we're trying to do um, is get people to come back and celebrate the area. So we're going, we, we have some unique uh, pole banners that we plan to unveil uh, in, in the coming weeks. Um, we're also gonna have sidewalk plaques and, and uh, markers, historic markers in the area similar to what you find in the Castro uh, district, uh, but we're also gonna be marking buildings uh, with plaques of historical significance. And we're also planning to, to install a gateway uh, to identify the neighborhood. Um, I, at, right now it's either gonna be on the corner of 8th and Folsom or 9th and Folsom. Uh, we have to work with the city on that. And the gateway is, up, is being designed right now, but we hope to have that uh, revealed in the coming months. Uh, one of our biggest projects are, are murals, and we have a couple significant murals in existence and a couple more going up. Um, last year, we unveiled the Sylvester mural, which is on the side of, of the Oasis Bar, um, and uh, we are working on a Showtime mural, which will be unveiled uh, on June the 2nd, and that will also be on the Oasis Bar. Um, Mr. S, which is our, our iconic leather uh, goods uh, vendor in the South of Market area, uh, has agreed to have a mural put on their building. Uh, and uh, we're hoping to start work on that in June, and we'll plan the unveiling sometime later on in the summer. And we're just now starting having, to have some discussions on putting a, a new mural on the side of the Eagle Bar. Um, as a lot of you may know, the Eagle has uh, been designate, designated a historical site, uh, and this will be, uh, help commemorate that, that, uh, that designation. Mm, thank you, Bob. Um, finally, we are working on um, uh, a business incubator project where we're going to help uh, uh, new businesses come into the area that have a focus on leather and LG, on, in the LGBTQ community. Um, we hope to start that program sometime in July or August. And our long-term goal is to build a community center in the area uh, as a place to um, welcome pe people home back Beautiful. to the South of Market. Great. So that's uh, what uh, L our Leather and LGBTQ cultural district is all about these days. Thank you. I'm happy to share all of this with you and to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm sure um, you, you've got a great Instagram page. You've got a nice Facebook page. 
So everyone, please follow them because they're full of events. And by the way, congratulations. Uh, the Folsom Street Fair is now being replicated in Berlin and it's called the Folsom Strassenfest. Yes. <laughs> so this is a San Francisco <laughs> event that's being replicated in, you know, our friends in Germany. So anyway, <laughs> thank you so much, Bob. Thank you for presenting. Thank you, Bob. Now we're, yeah, now we're gonna switch over. We're, we're gonna go a little bit north to um, uh, District 6, uh, and we're gonna visit Soma Filipinas. Oh, so Soma Filipinas uh, actually shares the borders with two other cultural districts, Leather and Compton's Transgender, because uh, our boundaries are quite large. It goes from Market to Brandon, 2nd to 11th, it's a very special place here in San Francisco. Uh, for one, um, it is the home of uh, Tech 2.0. Every large tech company has a headquarters here, Uber Square, Twitter, Pinterest, you name it, they're all here. Uh, second, it's also an area that is designated for redevelopment by the city. So this map is actually from the planning department. So any buildings you see are like yellow or blue or green. This is where they're telling developers to buy buildings and property so they can build up to uh, address our housing crisis. So we really see the things that are happening in South America uh, in terms of economic development and disruption are kind of uh, trends that other communities may uh, find themselves in in the future. But the challenge that uh, our organization, Cultivate Labs, in partnership with Soma Filipinas, is trying to solve is how do we make ourselves look like Chinatown, Japantown, and Little Saigon? You know, we were just legislated in 2016, and these different uh, Asian communities have been around for decades, if not hundred, or if not for more than a hundred years. And what really kind of sets these Asian neighborhoods apart is that they have a commercial corridor. So you know when you've entered or left, which is kind of a challenge that we have in some of the Filipinas because we have such a large area. But most importantly, a commercial corridor addresses income inequality, the most vexing problem of all residents in, in the Bay Area. You know, there's a lot of different ways to solve income inequality. There's good government policy, and there's also getting a good job. Obviously, Filipinos have figured out how to get into healthcare because so many of us are nurses and doctors. Some of us will go into the good government job others into tech, maybe some into real estate development, but what we're really focusing on is really developing and cultivating creative entrepreneurship in our district. And so one of the ways that we've done this in the past five years is produce an event called Undiscovered. To the outside world, it's a big creative night market filled with Filipino food and arts and culture. Uh, there's over 15 different food vendors, 40 different retail vendors. It moves around year to year. Uh, out of a function because every large parking lot in San Francisco gets developed into a new building. Uh, but, it, but that really challenges our community and our team to really push harder and to make this event bigger and badder every year. And uh, from that uh, night market, what we've seen is that we've seen a dramatic growth in economic activity with a lot of our micro enterprises. We started with 125,000 in initial funding from the city. And then in that first year, we doubled that into $250,000 in economic activity. When I mean economic activity, that's sales within the marketplace to all of the vendors. And every year we grow 10%, almost like if we were a little Asian, Asian economy tiger, and then the pandemic hit. And so we're still recovering like everybody else. But I think in 2022, we might hit that 300K mark again. Um, so outside of producing night markets, where we've also gone in, into the business of placemaking. Um, a couple of years ago, OEWD and Zendesk gave us like $40,000 in a sliver of a parking lot. And they asked us, what could you do with it? And we imagined creating a health and wellness uh, prototype that we call the Undiscovered Court. It was uh, built by 70 volunteers and was based off uh, Filipino Vinta sales. And we made a half court basketball court. We rang it with like food trucks and did different kinds of health and wellness activities, which led us to the next project. So after that one shut down after two months, we won an RP from the city for an even larger parking lot that's 9,000 square feet. That's located on Mission Street between 5th and 6th Street, where we organized uh, over 350 volunteers over the course of six months during the darkest, darkest days of the pandemic when there's nothing to do. We had them grade gravel and create this beautiful Technicolor oasis of a, a, of a performance stage for our vendors and performers to perform safely outdoors. And this is the other side of it. It's divided by a bus that we've turned into a psychedelic jeepney and rang it with uh, 
uh, planters filled with calamansi trees are completely mobile. And so we're able to host mini food festivals, other nonprofit events, uh, Filipino martial arts classes, you name it, we can host it there. And uh, beyond that, uh, we also have other programs that I'll let uh, Aaron discuss. So my name is Aaron Ursino. I am the program manager for, for Seed Network. And Seed Network is one of the programs uh, from Cultivate Labs that is the umbrella organization for what you just saw for Undiscovered Night Market for Couple Gardens. And um, Seed Network handles the small business programs um, for Cultivate Labs within Summa Filipinas. So I'm gonna be touching on three of our programs that I help to lead. One is called Seed Network, one is called Seed Accelerator, and one is called Little Pina. Um, so these are just some of the businesses that have uh, we've worked with in the past, um, helping to um, solve their problems. Um, we, we do have kind of a specialty in the retail and food space, um, but these are just some of our, our alumni that um, have gone through the program and are uh, achieving success around the city now. <clears throat> so first we're gonna talk about Seed Network Grant. And uh, I have to give a shout out to, to Scott at Wells Fargo. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me, it wouldn't be possible without him. Um, this time around, I, I mentioned that we had a kind of a focus on B, B2B and we wanted to kind of extend this to create a larger network and start to include more B2B service providers. So with the way that this grant works is um, this year we're going to give out six grants, uh, two per two per quarter, and the way it works is that any minority-owned business in the entire Bay Area they can um, apply for a grant. Uh, we'll do an interview with them to understand their needs and their problems, and then we'll try to match make them with another uh, business in the network that is a service provider. So uh, specific services like marketing, legal, social media, public relations, branding. Um, so we take these two businesses, one in need and one that can provide service. We pair them together, help them to create a project plan, oversee the entire thing. And then we use grant money from Wells Fargo in order to pay for those services. So the idea is that we keep money within the ecosystem. Uh, we build bonds. Uh, we create a network of trusted providers. Um, you know, with, as business owners, there's so many things on your mind. When you have a hundred plates spinning, um, sometimes all you need to unlock the next level is just that right referral. So with Seed Network, that's what we're trying to do. And I'm just going to go through maybe one example here. Um, say, for example, you've created a webinar art series. Uh, you connect with an online marketer who can increase your reach and awareness. And as a result, you increase your, your bottom line. Uh, you get 100 new enrollments this month. So I've got a couple more examples here. I'm just going to hop through those. Um, so that is the Seed Network grant. And we are going to be opening up our next round of grants this month. So if you know a minority owned business, well, everybody knows a minority owned business owner, um, you can send them our way and then we'll do what we can uh, to help solve their problems. The next one is called Seed Accelerator and this focuses more on um, some of Filipinas. So in order to apply to this uh, grant, you have to be a Filipino owned business in Soma. And as you know, our, our major initiative at Cultivate Labs in the Soviet Philippines is to create a thriving cultural district um, in line with the work that Desi showed and um, the work that I'm doing here. You know, in order to have uh, Filipinos come to the area, you need to have Filipino businesses. And that starts with getting business owners into brick and mortar locations. And, and our focus right now is on Mission Street between 4th and 5th. So with, with the C Accelerator, um, the funding comes from MOHCD, uh, SOMA CAC, and OEWD but it's a bit more targeted in that we work directly with Filipino owned businesses locally. And then we have um, kind of like a stable of trusted consultants. Uh, we identify what their needs are and then we use the money and funding from uh, those groups in order to specifically solve those problems. So it's, it's, it's much more targeted. And that program is gonna be kicking off in the next 60 days. In addition to that, um, lastly, we have kind of an interesting business concept. And what you're looking at right here is actually a mobile trailer that is positioned inside Couple Gardens. Uh, it's called Little Pina, which is like little pineapple. And um, what it allows here is kind of a low barrier to entry way for a food concept to validate their idea and kind of work out the kinks. So for example, uh, right now, this is uh, an example of a business position at Couple Gardens. Um, they can focus on 
just producing the food, um, getting their menu right, uh, getting their staffing all together, work out the kinks there, um, and that they have a chance to kind of validate their concept at a, an event at Couple Gardens. Like, for example, um, Desi, not to call you out, but uh, do you want to talk about uh, the Yum Yams Fest and uh, the vendor that was at? Yeah, so, you know, we used a little piña uh, uh, kind of rolling food incubator to allow food entrepreneurs to, like, uh, jumpstart their business quickly. And so we do a lot of large scale events in the corridor that uh, utilize this trailer. You know, it saves them like $300 in health permits and about four hours in setup time. And, you know, vendors who utilize this trailer could uh, make upwards of like $4,000 in a day. Yep. And uh, it it's in partnership with All the Sauce. And the person that runs that, her name is Kristen Billantes. They're actually from the Sarap Shop, which is the Filipino food vendor that's actually in Chase Center. They always have a line going down the block. Um, she used to be from Google Ventures and she's also a business management consultant. So she has a program called All the Sauce and um, in conjunction with uh, this uh, retail concept for Little Pina, um, she helps to solve your problems as a fledgling food business owner. All right, so lastly, um, you know, we're always looking for volunteers, um, donations to help out and um, any procurement leads, we're trying to get deeper into the procurement space. We have this network of businesses. We're trying to find uh, medium to large businesses in San Francisco who are open-minded to um, building these kinds of relationships with, with the community. Thank you. Well done, Desi, Aaron, that was excellent. Um, I was gonna say, what are some uh, social media accounts that people can, you know, just to follow you guys? Cause you guys are really activity centric. Um, Permanent, non, you know, pop-ups. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can drop them in the chat. Bravo. Yep. Yeah. Join, join Seed Network, Couple Gardens, Cultivate Labs. Desi got it. Totally, Members. totally. Um, but thank you for providing this nice overview because, you know, music, food, and art bring people together, no matter where they come from. So as long as we keep promoting this and you guys are promoting this, you know, we, we can't just depend on our communities anymore we have to reach out and create new partnerships with other communities around the city as well so thank you for the overview and thank you for um, bringing us together Vez. yeah that was very immersive thank you very much um now we're going to go to always sunny mission it's always sunny and the vibes are always good in district nine and uh we have a very special friend Susana rojas she's the executive director of calle 24 latino cultural district in the in district nine so um welcome aboard susanna good to see you again good to see you again and thank you for having me and this is a hard presentation to follow but i'll do my best to um to follow our, our partners and some of the filipinas um so like you said my name is susanna rojas i'm the executive director for uh, the latino cultural district and the latino cultural district is actually the first cultural district in the country and we take a lot of pride of being able to uh, to to claim that and it's a it's a story of love right it started 25 years ago with uh, neighbors who joined forces and decided that together we were going to advocate and take care of our community. And uh, our founder, uh, what, well, one of our founders, um, Eric Arguello, continues to be our, our president for our board, and he continues to advocate every day for our Latino community. Um, the Latino Cultural District is also home to the largest outdoor mural um, pathway or district in the city. I mean, in the in in the country, I believe. And and now we are hoping that on Saturday we're going to be adding seven new permanent um, small micro murals in our in our corridor on Twenty Fourth Street and. Uh, five more uh, uh, temporary urban murals in our corridor. We're also going to be kicking off a program that's called Calle Limpia Corazón Contento in partnership with the American Indian Cultural District. And because right now we're entering the recovery phase of the pandemic and, um, and our small businesses suffer through the whole pandemic. They, you know, they they strive. They they try really hard. They they put their brains together. They figure out ways to survive. But now that we have this new 
in this new phase in the pandemic, we all have to join forces. One of the things that our, our community and the mission is very, very well known for is for pilot programs, for creative, created ways of uh, responding to big issues. And that's what we're doing with our recovery. So this, this Saturday at 10 a.m. If you can come by, come to 24th and Mission. We are going to have a big cleanup. And if you ever go on to a Latino household on a Saturday when people are cleaning, you're going to have music. You're going to have uh, the whole family involved. You're going to have food. It's going to be a party while we're cleaning. That's what we're doing this Saturday. We have live murals going. We're going to have DJs all along the corridor. We're going to have community members coming together to shower our community with love and, and help us clean. And we're launching our vendorship program where um, our vendors on Mission Street are going to be outfitted with the same merchandise when you come to the mission and you get off 24th and Bart, you're going to be able to see the vendors completely identified and be able to say, okay, this is this is a, a small business that I want to, to um, support and that I want to, to give my money to. So we hope to see you there right now. This project, as you guys can imagine, is a pilot. So there's a lot of moving pieces. We are extremely hopeful, but we also know that if people ever want to come and, and volunteer. We're going to be doing these events quarterly. Um, the next event is going to be on August 13th and we're going to be focusing on the north side of the mission to support our, our, our sisters and brothers at, um, at the American Indian Cultural District and we'll start on 16th and, and we'll do the same thing or a variation of what we're doing on 24th Street on 16th Street and, and we just want to be able to, like I said before, shower our community with love because what we learned through the pandemic is that when community comes together, when community works, and with the city, with the with the members of our community, with our small businesses, with the with everyone, then we succeed, and that's what we're trying to do. So please come over, get some good food, get a little bit of cleaning going, and watch some beautiful art happening this Saturday. Thank you. That was beautiful. Good, and that and that's what the mission is about, right? Art, hospitality. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to cruise up to the west side. We're going to go up towards the west, uh, the Castro, and I uh, have my new friend, uh, Levy Maxwell. He is the Workforce and Economic Development Committee Chair for the Castro LGBTQ Cultural District. Welcome to the stage, Levy. Hi, y'all. Um, you know, I'm happy to just have heard all y'all like I used to live in in the the Latino cultural district spend so much time in Soma and the leather cultural district um, my family has connections to the Japanese cultural district in Western Edition and you know as the Filipino cultural district I've gone to your theaters and, and just like the spaces that you've been able to activate so thank you for so much for incorporating and inviting us to come along too um, so yeah, my name is Levi. I'm part of the Workforce and Economic Development Committee with the Castro Cultural District. Um, we're a cultural district that was signed in by London Breed back in 2000, I mean, uh, 2019, July. Uh, so we're not the newest, but you know, we, we've been able to kind of like ground ourselves a little bit, establish a kind of mark in our, our neighborhood. Um, so uh, for, for, for in my role, uh, we originally started in, in COVID and it was COVID economic relief and support. Um, when we first came on, I think there are some established programs and organizations and, and, and businesses in the neighborhood who are like, who are, who are you guys? Like, you know, they're, they were very hesitant to work with us, but, you know, with the, we were able to provide vaccines and we were able to prioritize workers from different businesses and establishments to be prioritized. Um, so that we were able to, you know, have someone come on their work break to be able to take five minutes, be able to skip an otherwise long line to get their vaccinations and go back to work and ensure that they had a level of safety. Um, and that was for anyone who worked at any of the businesses in the Castro, regardless of their place of residence, because as LGBT people, um, you know, those of us who know the Castro know it's not the most um, affordable neighborhood to live in, um, but you know it, it takes individuals from around the city and around the the Bay Area to to make this place possible and 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 kind of provide um, an opportunity to to be our authentic selves, uh, regardless of our incomes. Um, 
So we did a round one business support with Healing Cuts, which is a Latino owned business that's in the Castro next to Bo. Um, and we're actually gonna be getting our part two uh, with a total of $60,000 in our first fiscal year with them. Um, it's a, been a pleasure and a joy to like figure out like what are the kinds of businesses that we need beyond just services, but who are the kinds of people that we want to see represented more as business, uh, as business entrepreneurs in the Castro. I, I think we all have our idea and our, uh, you know, we have our idea of who is someone who lives in the Castro, um, who is a business owner in the Castro. Um, and it's un honestly understanding the history of the, the Castro being not the first gay neighborhood, but the first gay middle class neighborhood. Polk Gulch was a gay neighborhood that was really working class and trans forward, of color forward. Then Jose Sarev in North Beach was also an of color working class kind of like community leader and labor, I mean, um, sorry, um, activist. So it's like, how do we change the tone of the Castro from being one of exclusion to one that's like actively creating uh, queer leaders and a, a queer presence that also recognizes the cultural diversity of San Francisco and the Bay Area as a whole. Um, also, wait, am I talking too fast? <laughs> <laughs> you're good you're good good information i think one of the really important things that the castro cultural district is doing right now is modeling business practices around cultural competency and cultural humility um when we were doing vaccines we had to ensure that we had security um of course anyone in the neighborhood was able to access uh, vaccinations and we are currently in the midst of um a housing crisis and there are individuals who are on the street however the security that we have um, that we were able to hire, for example, was this amazing queer woman who had a sense of knowledge of harm reduction, of active communication, nonviolent communication, and then we're just trying to showcase what are the kinds of things that we need to see to make a more well-rounded community that is centered around harm reduction and safety. Um, and, you know, speaking of the vaccinations as a whole, COVID has been rough um, in the Castro. Um, bars are a centerpiece of our businesses. You know, everyone comes here for a party. When Biden won, the entire neighborhood blew up. You know, it's just like, this is a celebratory neighborhood. Um, but it's just like, I, I think one of the really important things that we've been able to do in the Castro Cultural District is creating a chess report. We're able to get over a hundred people's inputs of like, what are, where are we at? Um, what do we need to focus on? And where are we heading in terms of funding, goals, and, and what should we put our focus and energy on? Um, I, I think the Castro has a level of visibility, not only on a regional scale, but on a global scale. And, and I think what's important for me to recognize and what's important for the board to, to recognize is how we do things here might be and will be replicated elsewhere in LGBT communities. So the focus that we need to have now is how to incorporate people who are not the traditional, the traditionally associated people of the neighborhood. And, and how do we showcase that, like, we are at the precipice of, of change and, and, and how do we create a more, how do I put this? The way in which we're able to, to create greater stability is, is through a strategic, strategic desire to bring different people together um, and, and, and understanding that diversity is more than just a whole bunch of color of Benetton faces, but a diversity of outlooks, a, dif a diversity of opinions and a diversity of strategies is what will keep us the keep us as the LGBT neighborhood that we all know it as. Ugh. Thank y'all. <laughs> That's beautiful. Bravo, Levy. Mm -hmm. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank you all for giving your overview because um, San Francisco is blessed in many ways. And, you know, it's not always a perfect picture. Sometimes it's contentious, but um, I personally appreciate the way we are a collaborative bunch and we celebrate our differences. Um, and in many ways, San Francisco is a city of outsiders, you know, that has come together and, you know, we've created this amazing um, city. Um, but I just want to mention that um, this is a curated selection of cultural districts and there is an African American arts and cultural district as well in District 10. There's also a um, a Compton's transgender district as well in the middle of the city. And there's actually an American Indian cultural district as well in the middle of the city too. And hopefully uh, we'll have another opportunity to highlight them as well. So I'm speaking to you Wells Fargo. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's almost time, but I do have a question for you all. We're entering this uh, Q and A period right now. Quick question all around. Um, we've been through tremendous change with COVID, we don't wanna you know, delve too deep into that. Uh, but uh, I just wanna get 
positive takeaways? What did we learn from our COVID experience? Um, Susie, you're first. Um, me personally, I think for COVID, it made me really realize what's important to me. My friends, my family, my connection to our people uh, in our lives that matter. Um, and also meeting the ability to meet people online um, has been amazing too. So that's, that's what it, uh, with all the, you know, awful things that COVID brought, it also really brought some wonderful things and friendships as well. So that's what it did for me. Bravo, good point. And I would agree with you, like, these uh, programs that we're doing with NexusF, we get people from Europe tuning in, from Asia. It's, it's an amazing way to communicate and share ourselves as brands, as individuals. Um, so I'm gonna go to Bob Brown next. What was the positive takeaway from COVID? You know, I, 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 I was thinking about this. And I, I think for me, um, I, the need to show up and, and be there, whether it's uh, via a, uh, a Zoom meeting like this um, mm -hmm. or showing up uh, outdoors with a mask on and, and supporting, uh, supporting whatever needs to be supported and, and, and promoted. Um, and, and, and not to say I have to be isolated because that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 think, I think just showing up whenever and wherever and however I can do that. Mm, bravo, that's beautiful. Um, let's go to Desi. COVID is practice for climate change and climate disaster. So anyone who really kind of like was resilient and was able to bounce back quickly, those are the people you're gonna want in your camp when the shit hits the fan. Okay, that was, that was perfect. Um, let's switch over to Susanna. Talk to me. I think for me has been the resiliency of our community. Mm -hmm. um, the way in which they found ways to join, um, well, not they, all of us find, found ways to join forces to figure out new creative ways to support each other, new creative ways to make sure that nobody was going hungry. Um, lots of, of, of beautiful, kind moments and moments of love that, that we were able to, to witness that for me will over will always be the takeaway from this because if we can survive this pandemic mm. by not forgetting and not giving up our humanity, we can survive everything. And I feel like that's, that's what happened during this pandemic. We were able to join forces together and put what was more, most important at heart and together protect those who are most vulnerable. So um, yeah, I think that's what I will always take away as an individual and also as a as an organization. Bravo! Lots lots of lots of love there, Levy. Tell us what was a positive takeaway for you and your organization. Yeah, I think the, at the same time that COVID is going on, the the sky turned orange and the resurrection of Black mm. Lives Matter occurred with George Floyd. We were at like this crossroads of absolute chaos and what I really saw were individuals really breaking patterns of how things were and how they originally thought because mm -hmm. the sky is orange and we're all on fire. Um, mm -hmm. And people were able to, the people who were able to, to radically shift their way of thinking of not only the world around them, but how they're going to survive and make it and how they're gonna survive and make it together was an inspiration. Um, and and um, I, we're still not out of it yet. You know, we're still in the midst of new viral strains and um, people who are immune compromised and people who are house are still heavily impacted. Um, but I think after what we went through the, the past couple of years, I think those individuals are really being thought of. And, and those individuals are also advocating for themselves in a way that now people are listening. And that's what's most important. Bravo, bravo. Aaron, my friend, you're going to close it out. Everyone took all the good, good words already. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Mine was going to be resiliency. Uh, but I learned that um, technology helps us to move really fast. I think everybody got really 
used to working really efficiently, not having to put pants on and go, you know, hop on, on the Muni, um, it frees you up to do a lot more with your time. And just people getting used to that pace where you can be in a, you know, a, a, an important webinar just in the blink of an eye. Um, it really unlocked the way that people um, share messages and the way that people connect. Um, and I think that's definitely a, a positive benefit. I don't, I don't miss commuting at all. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of a blessing. Um, but on a personal note, it's the, to, you know, realize your, who your loved ones are and, and keep them close. Um, so thank you guys. Oh my God. This has been such a great program. Um, just want to thank you all. This is, this is like a shining example of San Francisco's uh, resourcefulness, innovativeness, sense of community collaboration. And you guys are shining examples of that. Um, I really want to thank you for joining us today. Um, but all good things must come to an end. This program is coming to an end now. I want to thank you again sincerely for joining us. And as you all can see, all the attendees, um, you guys represent the symbol of San Francisco, the Phoenix. Uh, the city is alive and well, coming back stronger than ever. And um, personally, I've been all over the city. I've witness the newfound energy people want to collaborate they want to make new connections and really get involved and show up as bob said it's really important to show up and support in any way you can through volunteering through sponsorships tell your companies that these organizations are doing great stuff so uh, we want to support the people individuals that are um, contributing to our culture and our economy so um, thank you wells fargo yet again you guys are great community partners. And, um, and that's why we wanna highlight these cultural assets and the small businesses that make our city special. So thank you, enjoy the rest of the day and share this program all over the place. Bye-bye. Thank you.